Alright, so welcome to ResiStat. We're so excited to have you all here. For those of you who haven't been with us before, ResiStat is an opportunity to just kind of get an overview of what's happening both in your ward as well as in Somerville overall. We'll go through lots of different types of data, um, updates about what's going on um, both in the city and in the ward, as I said, um, and you'll hear from city staff. So we do have a Chief Green from Somerville Fire, Chief Allen from um, Somerville Police, as well as um, some other city staff, including Director of Engineering, Rich Raish, um, and the Mayor will also be here um, Hopefully momentarily, he is doing double duty tonight, so he's currently at the domestic violence vigil, um, but he will be joining us later this evening. If you do have a copy of the slides, most of the slides, um, the copies of the slides have um, what we are going to show tonight. They do not include the engineering section. Um, these slides will also be posted online, and we are recording all of the Resi staff meetings, so those will be available online at the very end of the month. Uh, I'm going to hand things over to Ward 6 City Councilor Lance Davis, um, so he can just kind of kick, kick things off for us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to, uh, to a round of applause. You certainly did nothing to deserve that. Um, I'm not going to say much at all because we're getting started a little late. I'm thrilled to see the uh, the video back here. I think we, we missed the last one for whatever reason, if I recall correctly. So something that I've been pushing for. Um, hopefully. Tell your friends or go watch themselves. I don't know if, if y'all are tracking the YouTube clicks on these, and uh, you know, but let's 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 show folks that it actually is worthwhile because I think these are these are valuable talks, and frankly, not everyone can get out uh, to a meeting on a on a weeknight at six thirty. So I think it's important that we make that that information available to everybody um, across the spectrum. So um, that's about it. Obviously, there's a ton of stuff going on much of which won't really be discussed that much tonight. Um, I, you know, you all know how to reach me, and, and, and you've all uh, taken advantage of that uh, quite a bit recently. I've been reading a ton of emails. Keep them coming. Uh, we're reading, considering everything. And uh, I'll hang around a bit afterwards for questions as well. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, so, for those of you who have a copy of these slides, there is an agenda. Just to kind of give you an overview of what we'll be covering tonight, we won't be doing a super deep dive into any one topic, um, but we do encourage questions and we will try to take questions after each section. Um, restrooms are outside the hall on your right. A water fountain is tucked behind the door to your left. All right, let's get started. So diving into quick updates. Summer Baby is a program that we offer. It's um, sponsored by the Somerville Health and Human Services Department as well as the Somerville Learning Collaborative. Um, this program supports our newest residents, so our newborns, and um, there's multiple different types of resources and support systems that um, this program can connect new families with, and um, it supports babies from newborn all the way up to one years old. This is a multilingual home visiting program, so we also have summer baby home visitors um, to schedule an appointment um, or to find out more information. There's a link as well as multiple um, points of contact. Um, for families who are seeking prenatal care or are wondering about programs that support young children all the way up to three years old, we do have a variety of other programs available as well. And like I said, these slides will be posted online. So our lead service line replacement program recently got um, new funding and it is a effort to basically replace all the non-copper um, services in our city. Um, a way to check if your residence is affected is to visit somervillema.gov slash lead services. Um, if it does turn out that your pipes might be on the older side and um, are, do qualify for this program, we do offer a replacement free of charge. Um, applications are due by December 2019 if you do want to be considered for replacement starting next year in the spring. Um, for any more information on this, feel free to visit the website, summervillema.gov slash lead services, as well as you can contact the engineering department, um, extension 5400. So rethinking our reusable and recyclable materials. Um, this is really interesting. We have seen recycling in the news a lot. Um, oftentimes, I think a lot of us are thinking, you know, recycle as much as we can. Right now, we are kind of thinking, how do we reassess um, or reassess how we throw away things. So thinking about contamination, there are two types of contamination. We have, I think most people use at home a bin that sorts, 
multiple types of materials, as well as the public recycling bins. Um, they can take anything from metal, glass, plastic, etc. Um, so throwing away things that don't are cannot necessarily be recycled as well as throwing away things that have food contamination or liquids that really does affect the process of how these materials can be recycled. Um, most of the things that are recyclable may be intuitive, but if you are ever unsure, we do have a really great tool, the Waste Wizard, so summervillema.gov slash wizard, um, will help you kind of find, <laughs> and we have an example here. So yes. this. No. <laughs> yes, There's exactly. A, I rip them off, Whoa. put that in the compost. Drive my wife nuts. Yeah, so that's a great example. Um, it doesn't seem like it's a lot of food, but it really does affect the process. Um, some things that we um, may not think of as intuitive is plastic bags actually do not go in the recycling bin the way that the machines sort our recyclables. Um, sometimes plastic bags or plastic wrap or film can really get stuck in those machines and kind of slow down the process as well as increase the cost. Um, all right, moving on. So the West Branch Library is under construction. We broke ground early on, um, earlier in the year in the spring. Um, there is ongoing site work. Um, in this photo right here, you can see the elevator shaft being built. We're really excited to see this project to its completion. Right now it is on schedule to open up in the summer of 2020. Um, if you want to find out more about this project or library um, hours, you can visit either of these websites. Um, we'd like to remind you to register to vote. The, de the, the deadline for voting is coming up in about two weeks on Wednesday, October 16th. There are three ways to register to vote or change your address. You can do it either online through mail or you can register in person at City Hall with the Elections Department. Um, for more information or details, feel free to visit summervillema.gov slash elections. So the Davis Square Neighborhood Plan, um, after a six-year community process, this was presented to the planning board on September 26th, so not too long ago. The full plan is available to download and view at summervillebydesign.com slash neighborhoods slash Davis. Um, we are still accepting written testimony and we do want to hear your feedback. Um, if you do have comments or questions, we do encourage you to email planning at summervillema.gov before or by November 1st. Um, and we do have an upcoming planning board meeting, which is tomorrow. Um, and for more information, summervillezoning.org or .com. Yeah, like, is, yep. it, is, is the plan on the agenda? Is, is the plan on the agenda for tomorrow? Yeah. I'll check on that. Okay. So Powerhouse Boulevard, um, the pavement markings have been completed. We continue to monitor and assess this area. Um, we are aware that there are various stakeholders who are interested um, in additional changes and um, the community process will be continuing. Uh, we do have staff available here to answer any questions that you may have about this project. So the Seven Hills Park grass restoration. Last fall we decided to restore the grass in Seven Hills Park. Um, we are deciding to do it again this year. So I think around after Honk Festival in the fall through the winter um, we'll have the grass um, We'll have a barrier around the grass to just kind of aerate it, reseed it, and then make sure it's um, fully restored. So the Brown Schoolyard and West Somerville Neighborhood Schoolyard are both being redesigned. We've chosen a um, designer, so I believe it's CBA Landscape Architects. Um, and just stay tuned for an upcoming community meeting, which will be either in late October or early November. Um, that event will be posted on the city website, and if you'd like to learn more information, feel free to contact the Parks Director on Branson. So the Greenland Extension, um, this project is ongoing. It is on schedule to open by the end of um, 2021. To make this process possible, as you all may have experienced and know, there are bridge closures. Um, the Broadway Bridge is on track to reopen in March of 2020. The Washington Street Bridge is now expected to be closed throughout the winter, but will be reopening in April of 2020 rather than the fall of 2020. MassDOT um, is going to put out an official notice about this um, closure soon. And then for the Medford Street Bridge, um, it will reopen late spring of 2020. School Street Bridge is also expected to close in early spring of 2020. 
Um, the next public meeting for this will be in November of 2019. And we know that this process has been probably very trying and um, complex for many of us who live in here and try to commute daily. We are doing our best to remain vigilant throughout this process um, and to monitor traffic management. We do have a team dedicated to this specifically, um, and this includes staff from fire, police, mobility, engineering, traffic and parking, communications, as well as other staff that are communicating um, with our state partners. We have a three-pronged approach, um, and we have done various efforts, including the Reboot Your Commute campaign with the GLX team. Um, we have seen success through those efforts, um, but we do appreciate your feedback and hearing from you about how these um, changes are affecting your lives, as they are for many of staff um, who work in City Hall. And if you do have concerns, we encourage you to continue reporting them, either through 311 or emailing construction at summervillama.gov. We have multiple ways to stay informed. The MassDOT um, GLX website has really great up-to-date information. We also have the City of Somerville construction resources. We have a newsletter and a website. They both contain updated information. City Alerts is a great way to um, kind of stay uh, informed about what is going on in the city, whether it's um, closures or detours. And the City Newsletter is also a great way to get an overview of what's happening in the city. All right, so now I'm going to pass things off to Chief Breen. He's going to go over um, response times as well as career opportunities in the fire department. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Charlie Breen, fire chief. Uh, you talk uh, about response times during uh, what we call the dreaded construction period, which thankfully is only temporary. Uh, long before the, the shovels went in the ground and the demolition crew showed up, the fire department uh, sat down and worked on response plans. Uh, we worked closely with uh, Brad Ross and Rich Rage, Jesse Moose uh, from the city, also the police department have been great partners uh, to, to make sure that we were prepared. We knew all knew there was gonna be traffic, but we had to be prepared for how we were gonna get around the city to get the emergencies in, in a quick manner. Uh, and uh, we did that through uh, planning and changing response to our plans and working out uh, agreements with uh, Cambridge, Medford, Arlington, and Boston for East Somerville. And uh, I think as you'll see in the next slide that our plans are working and uh, they validate all the planning that we, that we did. Believe it or not, uh, response times for the past six months during the construction period, despite the Washington Street Bridge closed, the Ball Square Bridge closed, the Medford Street Bridge closed, and Union Square being full of giant craters, uh, our response times are lower this year in the past six months than they've been in the past four years. So, I can't give enough credit to the men and women who are out there driving the apparatus and the officers that in char are in charge of the apparatus that have to stay on top of these, uh, these closures and, and navigate the streets. But as you can see, they're doing a fantastic job. I'm very proud of the job they do. And uh, we're, we're getting to these calls well below the five-minute recommended response times, as you can see. So, I, I, and a lot of credit goes to the interdepartmental cooperation that I said that we have. Um, every day I get a report from my analyst on response times for the previous 24 hours. And any, any response times that are over five minutes get flagged, and we delve into what was the cause. And as Dave Fallon will tell you, I'm on the phone, I'm on the phone, Dave, we need an officer down here on this corner at this intersection. I'm on the phone with Bradless and we got to do some better signage here or whatnot. Uh, and I, I can't say enough for having great partners uh, in these other departments. They've, they've helped us out immensely. Um, and, you know, as we all have to realize, these are only, thankfully, temporary situations. As you saw the slide from Taylor, you don't have any idea how I am looking forward to the Ball Square Bridge reopening, the Washington Street Bridge reopening, the Memphis Street Bridge reopening, and Union Square getting asphalted over so that we can get back and forth through there. Uh, I've had many sleepless nights uh, over this, and uh, a lot of the, it's very stressful for the guys out in the field driving the trucks as well, but I'm very proud of the work that's being done, and, and it's paying off. Uh, one more thing I'd like to touch on today 
is uh, on November 16th, we'll be having a career open house at fire headquarters at 266 Broadway from 10 to noon. Uh, what we're seeing over the last couple of years is that the amount of candidates taking the fire exam is dropping, and it's concerning. We want to, uh, we want to get the word out um, the, about careers in the fire service. It's a great career. Uh, we feel that maybe uh, not enough people know about it. The next exam is going to be in uh, April of 2020. We're also working hard to uh, better diversify the department. Uh, a more diversified department is, is obviously better for the department. It's better for the city. Uh, it, it really helps us do our job better. So uh, we've, uh, fire department's been working uh, very closely with personnel department. We've been getting out to uh, different community organizations, uh, faith-based organizations, uh, spreading the word uh, to try to uh, get more diversified candidates to take the exam. And I, I encourage anybody here, if they can get the word out, anybody that's 19 years or older, that you think might be a good candidate for the fire department, let them know. Come to our open house on November 16th. Uh, if they can't make that, then uh, there's a number here for uh, Jennifer Mancia. We'll work closely with her for personnel at Extension 3300. And uh, I encourage uh, people to uh, come visit us and learn more about the fire department. Uh, we'd like to see a larger group of candidates in the future uh, and a more diverse uh, crowd taking the exam. If anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. If not, I'll be hanging around. Chief, would be helpful to remind folks about shoveling out hydrants when it starts snowing up more tomorrow? Sure, thank you, Brad. Um, with the snow in the winter time and the crowded streets, the parking and whatnot, uh, we, we could always use a uh, hand from residents in the city. If you have a hydrant near your house, if you could shovel it out for us, it would be greatly appreciated. After every storm, we, we head out to check the hydrants, but obviously we have many, many fire hydrants in the city and only so many pieces of apparatus, and it takes us days to get around to make sure every hydrant is shoveled out. So the more help we can get um, from, the, from the residents in the city would be greatly appreciated. Uh, when there's a fire, uh, the last thing we want is delays, trying to find the hydrant, dig it out. So if we, if, you know, there's nothing more... Um, we leave, there's nothing that leaves us more in the winter time to pull up and there's a hydrant already shoveled out. I mean, it just makes the whole operation go smoother. So if we could <coughs> get your cooperation with that, it'd be greatly appreciated. Where, where is it at? I can check, I'll check with the water department. I'll check with the water department. What just happened was, probably what happened was we just recently finished the citywide hydrant testing. We do it once a year, and oftentimes that um, results in us finding maybe a couple of dozen hydrants that aren't working, and then obviously it takes the water department probably a couple of weeks or a month to catch up and replace them all. It all depends what the what the problem is with the hydrants, but I, I will check with the water department. Okay, absolutely. Yep. I, I will check with the water department tomorrow for you. And I'll be around. Oh. Uh, just uh, going back to career opportunities, is there a summerville residence requirement for the fire department? Yes, you have to be a summerville resident uh, for one year prior to taking the exam. That's a good question. Um, <coughs> is it is it posted anywhere, Rich? So right now the GIS database is an internal viewing for staff only. We're working on a publicly facing website. We're hoping to roll that out by the end of the year. It has all the from assessment database to location of fire hydrants, parking times, everything. How many current personnel are also Somerville residents in the fire service? How many? I'm sorry, you didn't get the question. How many of the Somerville fire personnel today are Somerville residents, live in Somerville? I wouldn't be able to answer. I wouldn't have that information. Well, most or not most? I would say not most. Um, they, they, for various reasons, obviously, but uh, you know, quite a few have moved elsewhere. But you do have to be a resident to, to, to get on the list. 
Thank you very much. I'm going to pass it off to Chief Fallon, and I'll be around afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. And if you might have witnessed history, this is the first time the fire department ever got anywhere before the police department. So a little piece of history tonight with a lot of respect for our Chief Green, but I want to do, introduce Captain James Delavan, who's your best district commander, who does a great job out here. And Lieutenant Sean Shear from our patrol division, We're very glad that he's here tonight as well. So I, we're going to start by talking about crime trends. Index crime um, has decreased 2% over one year and 3% over two years. Uh, that's citywide. So um, that's property crime and, and assaults. Ward 6, index crime has increased 14% over one year. And that's really primarily due to spikes in bike theft and commercial breaks. Really the driver of that is bicycle thefts. And you see we're mapping them. Here, pretty much through our crime analysis division on a daily basis, uh, you see the bike thefts in red, uh, and you see the number of them. Um, we put a lot of resources into solving this and preventing these, and we'll go over that in the next slide. To date, I can't say we've had a lot of success. Violent crime has decreased 11% uh, over one year, and Ward 6 is very important, but we know, we understand uh, how important uh, bicycles can be to people residing in the city. What we've done to address the issue, we just recently assigned a sergeant to oversee all bike theft investigations. Uh, we prioritized suspect identification and bike recovery. Um, we're now analyzing temporal and geographical patterns of incidents. So we can look at when they're happening, where they're happening, and try to get officers in that e area to um, ID, ID people who may be involved in searching. We see a lot of bikes turn up on uh, Facebook, the, the sales site on Facebook. And, things of that nature, neighborhood offices, and area cars deployed. I talked about this based on temporal patterns and hotspots, and increased residents awareness of crime that we're trying to do tonight, and some takeaways, how you can help us and help yourself from preventing yourself becoming a victim of bike theft. Uh, what else is going on in the police department? Always community, community engagement is, is vitally important to the Southern Police Department. We can't police the city without the cooperation of the community. We get our authority from the community. We need to be, we want to be partners with the community every step of the way. So that's vitally important to us. This year, early next year, we're really trying to reach out to the youth because we're really pushing with our offices that every interaction should you have with somebody in the community should be a positive one. Is it difficult to do at times when you're enforcing the law? It is. But as a command staff, we expect that. We expect you to go into these situations, every situation, with the mindset of de-escalation. And the mindset of your police officer, your job is to help people in the community. And it's vitally important. We're really reaching out to the youth. This summer we went up, we had a very well attended basketball clinic for the youth, youth in the city. There was free of charge, run by several police officers, a couple of called collegiate athletes that played basketball. Uh, the third and fourth year of doing the Junior Police Academy, it gets, it gets bigger and bigger every year. This year, we had 61 graduates. And it's really to see, you know, the work with the youth, to say, look, we're police officers, but we're also members of the community. We're also partners in the community. You know, we want to establish very positive relationships with them. Big thing here is the Summer Police Department was awarded accreditation by the Massachusetts Police Accreditation Commission in June of 2019, it's the first time Summer Police Department has ever been accredited. Usually, it's, it's not the norm for a police department of our size to receive accreditation. What it is is um, assessors come in and they analyze every part of your police department, from policies and procedures to you know, how you book prisoners to how you handle evidence to use of force policy. Every day we review every one of our policies and they have to meet the gold standard in policing. And we went through this long arduous process and we received accreditation this year in June. So it's really a tribute to the men and women of the Summer Police Department to accomplish that. So very excited about that. And you know, I think it's important. It's a, it's a source of pride for the men and women of the police department. And, you know, I understand as chief that policing is difficult today. And the optics on policing throughout the country is always is not always positive. So we have to strive to ensure that our officers know that every interaction they have with a member of the community 
can affect that person for the rest of their life. That's what policing is. In every interaction we have with a member of the community can affect the community for generations. I mean, that's what's on the shoulders of the men and women of the Summer Police Department. We're cognizant of that. We want to live up to your high expectations. We want high expectations for our officers. And we know the Summer Police community demands the best of us. And we appreciate the faith you put in us on a daily basis. But that will wrap up my presentation. Um, we're going to we'll leave with this. Our core office, we've been really stressing that the last few years. Sunville Police has a license, two licensed clinical social workers stationed right in the lobby of Sunville Police Department, a certified drug and alcohol counsel specialist that work with the officers every day to address the opioid crisis and people with mental health. You know, we're not going to arrest the way out of those situations, but we want to connect people to the services in our community that they need. And those people to our core office work, work with the officers on that on a daily basis. So, I appreciate your time tonight. I think I can take a couple of questions as well, if there's any. And uh, if not, I'll pass it off to. Oh, which? Yep. Yeah. Oh. Are you facing decoy bikes in order to try to catch bikes? We'll be in videotape. I'll say this: we're taking every measure possible. Okay. We can discuss. We can discuss afterwards some of the steps that we're taking. Okay. 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 In the back, yes, sir. Uh, what's the best way to report a package theft? <clears throat> yeah, the call is 617-625-1212 line, the business line. It's vitally important that you do call because that's a data point that we need to see where these are taking place. We, we actually, uh, I was talking with Captain Dunham, there, there was an arrest made recently uh, regarding uh, package thefts in Ward 6, and we think we'll see that decrease. But data is vitally, vitally important to policing today. Ma'am? Is there anyone in particular you talked with about noise complaints of some of our younger residents who are coming up in 10 feet from our river? I got your guy right here, Captain Donovan. But, but, I, but I can tell you, quality of life concerns, you know, we, we understand how it can affect your life if there's a major party going on. So I know he has daily conversations with Tufts. We've increased our patrols uh, in the Tufts area over the last few weeks, but you need a good night's sleep. I mean, and you deserve a good night's sleep. You, need, you deserve peace and quiet in your neighborhood. Thank you. <laughs> Sir? Um, congratulations on the accreditation. Thank you. Appreciate that. I've heard you speak a number of times, and I've been really impressed uh, with the database policing and uh, what I consider to be a really enlightened uh, way of thinking about addiction. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, and, and the point you made about the, the confidence and relationship between the police force and the citizens is a really important point. And so, when, when I heard about the, uh, the involvement of some of the police officers in the uh, uh, street, uh, pride, yeah. sure. it was really disheartening. Mm -hmm. And I know there's been a hearing, I wasn't able to go to it, but the, no, and I will, and I appreciate the question because I, I think I can tell you I understand the point of people that went in there. I think you know the optics of it is they have two groups and the police are putting themselves between those two groups, so it could look like the police are protecting a certain group against another group. But we have a mutual aid agreement with Boston. When, when Boston calls, you know I, I think we have a public safety obligation to go. I think we look we learned a lot in policing. We looked at Charlottesville, where we, where we allowed two opposing groups to engage each other. Somebody lost their lives, fights were breaking out on the street, so the police were there. I just want to be emphatic about this. When we go to a situation like that, it's, it's non-binary or non-political plus. We're there to protect everybody. The, the, the protesters, the counter-protesters, the bystanders, the people conducting business in the area, everybody. And that's the police role. I think for us not to go, and allow a situation like that to possibly deteriorate into force on force with two opposing groups. I, I think as police we have a responsibility to aid another organization. Could we do better? 100%. Should we look at every situation like this and in the future plan on changing the dynamic? 1000%. And I think we can always get better. I think we have to learn from all of these interactions, from these events, and continuously strive to get better. But I'll, I'll just say this, and we, we've been looking at it a lot. When I tell you a lot, we've been looking at it a lot. We're preparing an after-action report. 
But one thing I've walked away with myself personally, and as a police chief, is the police aren't going to solve this. We're going to solve this as a community. I mean a community bigger than some of them. When we talk about how we're going to engage each other as human beings and how we're going to settle our differences. So the police are there. I mean, I know the optics on it don't look good. I, I watch it as a police chief, and I'm not crazy about the optics. But I think as a society, we have to come together as a group and say, you know, we're going to work together on a solution to this. But I really appreciate that question. In the back, I can give you the microphone. I think it might be easier. I, I can talk really loud. <laughs> there, I have two quick questions. Sure. One is, do social workers ever accompany officers in response to a call that seems to involve mental health issues? And the other quick one I forgot. I'll get it. But <laughs> so we're working, we're, we're working towards that dual response model. And I think that's vitally important to have them on scene to de-escalate. We just received some grant funding. We're evaluating the model, the effectiveness of this, of that. But I think that's the future of policing. I think the future of policing is going there not necessarily the law enforcement roles, especially a mental health call. Because in those calls, the police officer arrest should be the last resort. It's almost like, what are you doing there? I think what happens is people are living with families members that are having mental health concerns. Things escalate in the family. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. Resources are exasperated. Who do you call the police? So you have a 19, 21-year-old police officer responding at 2 o'clock in the morning trying to de-escalate that. I think having a mental health professional on scene is vital. So I, we're working towards that co-responder model as we speak. And the other quick question is, is there a scam going around where people are calling up asking for donations to a police association I don't believe that's taking place right now. Not that I'm aware of. No. Yeah. But it could be happening. I would always. I, my advice would be if I got that call, I would confirm it with the Sambo Police Business Line six one seven six two five one two one two. I think if you ask for a show of hands, you would see a lot. Yeah. Can we take it? Because we could do a public. Yeah. So we'll address it on our social media. I'll investigate that. And if you look on some. To the I, think, uh, I think we've advised people in the past, especially when this happens with seniors, whether it's a police association, there's been a disaster and someone's calling for relief, you know, some other part of the world, ask them to send you the form. You know, I'll consider it. Send me your form. If it's legitimate, they're going to send you a, a letterhead form. Then you can call the police. But never do anything on the phone and certainly not on online. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think we work with our city partners uh, by inspectional services. I think that would be a 311 call. They would refer that to inspectional services. They would come out, measure it, take the readings, and, and, and take corrective action if necessary. Yeah. All right, well, I appreciate your time tonight, and uh, I hope you have a great rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks, everybody. Uh, so this summer was pretty brutal in terms of rain and flooding, so we were going to take this opportunity to give you an idea of what the city is doing uh, about the flooding issues. Uh, a couple of examples. Uh, Lake Street actually... <laughs> It's not named after a lake. It was named after a pre previous owner of the land, but it's now functioning as one. Uh, you know, obviously, flooding is a nuisance, but it is also uh, a public safety uh, hazard, uh, and it, it obviously has property damage. We obviously want to address these issues, improve the system to reduce the flooding for our own constituents, for, to remove the nuisance, to prevent against property damage, to protect uh, the health of our, our constituents and our ratepayers. But it's also important to know that the uh, conditions that give rise to flooding also give rise to combined sewer overflows that we're permitted for. So if we don't elect to do those things uh, to, to help our own ratepayers, we're going to be compelled by the federal and state regulators to do something about our system anyway. Uh, I would rather do the former than be uh, foisted uh, upon by the regulators to do the latter. Now, you know, 
different weather events are linked to flooding. There's precipitation-based flooding, there's coastal flooding, like what happened in Hurricane Sandy, that's coastal surge. Um, we're not entirely immune from coastal surge because uh, the Mystic uh, actually has a capability to come up to um, uh, Il uh, to uh, Assembly Square, and it's actually capable on very large um, climate change models indicate that the Amelia Earhart Dam can actually be flanked and Ten Hills neighborhood and as far up around as uh, Ilbeck Brook Parkway can be affected by storm surges. Uh, but the more routine problems are around precipitation. Obviously, uh, during the winter, we have problems around snow, so in addition to cleaning out the areas around hydrants, it's also good to know where your nearest catch basin is and don't pile snow on it or help clear that out uh, to alleviate snow melt flooding. Uh, the technical term is catch basin, don't say sewer, don't say great. So if you want to be wicked smart, say catch basin. <laughs> um, it, historically, we've designed the uh, systems around sustained rains. So you'll, you'll hear engineers talk about a 10-year storm or a 100-year storm. Essentially, a storm that happens in that uh, interval, so a 10% chance of happening in a year, a 1% chance of happening every year. And those are long duration, usually day-long storms that bring a lot of uh, uh, water. And so the pipes, specifically downstream, get bigger and bigger as the, the whole city contributes to them. What we've been seeing more of are the short burst intense rainfalls. And that's actually what happened this summer. Uh, the engineering department uh, because we get feedback now on when these uh, flooding events occur in the neighborhoods, we were able to look at those dates and go back to precipitation data. We found a strong correlation around three-tenths of an inch uh, in less than 15 minutes. When we get those types of cloud bursts, that's when we're getting the localized flooding that we saw this summer. And you see, just, the, thus, just thus far in 2019, we've had 12 of those types of events more than any other uh, year uh, in the past 10, and certainly more in the past five. Oh, maybe another time. Here we go. Uh, so what are we doing? So in terms of immediate response <coughs> when it happens, uh, you can call 311, you can submit 311 through the, the website, and the sewer department uh, goes out and clears the, the, um, the catch basins, clears the lines, alleviates the immediate acute problem to the extent that it can. We have uh, areas that we know are prone to flooding, so if we see a forecasted event coming, the sewer department will typically go out and check the lines at the maximum capacity out of the system that we can get to alleviate the problem. But the heart of the problem is that most of our pipes are too small for these types of storms, or even uh, the larger storms that we're seeing. So after the flood events, it's important that the engineering department hears about them. So we do have the engineering at uh, and we do encourage you, if you've seen uh, flooding, take uh, photos of it and uh, send it to us for when it happened so that we can do that sort of analysis and correlate the impacts to the storms and design around those. Um, and you know the problems are deeper than the emergency response, and they're a little bit more complicated too. There's different, not every uh, area in the city has the same solution or requires the same solution. So we have to look at what the, what the root causes are of the different flooding. Is it pipe, pipe capacity? Is it impervious area? Uh, is it the condition? Is it climate change? Geography? I mean, there, there are some low-lying areas in Somerville that used to be rivers and swamps uh, that are naturally prone to flooding. So the solution for those areas are, are different. Uh, and we are on a path to provide those long-term fixes. You know, there was a period of essentially 1920 through uh, maybe 2015 when the city didn't really build much in the way of uh, pipe infrastructure. We're now actually doing that. And, and as much as uh, I, the, the chief is right that you know, the bridges will eventually reopen, uh, I can't say that construction is stopping anytime soon uh, in, the, in the city. Um, because we have a lot of uh, catch-up to do on our pipe infrastructure. I mean, obviously, right now, we're working in Union Square, but we're hard at work designing and planning the next round of solutions. Um, the, the second round that are already in design are also more focused on Union Square, because that's actually the most complicated of all of our problems. Um, but we're now undertaking studies to evaluate what needs to be done in the other geographies. 
Um, so you'll be seeing uh, trucks going out, assessing the condition of our uh, system throughout the city. We're doing hydraulic modeling and uh, evaluating alternatives. We've put into our capital improvement plan placeholders for the projects that will eventually fall out of this study and design. So our recommendations for rate increases are foretelling of construction projects in the future. We're doing that now so that we do so we are avoid rate shock in the future. The, the concept is to slowly ratchet up the sewer rates so that we can pay for the uh, future construction and not have to suddenly uh, increase them significantly. It's also important to realize, again, we're doing this proactively because we want to solve the problems for our constituents. We're not waiting for the regulators to say, you've got a CSO problem, you have to go fix this, and here's your timetable for doing that, which is something that, that can and does happen. Um, when that happens, they use guidelines for affordability, and um, our sewer bills are nowhere near what EPA considers affordable. Um, so that the idea that uh, that rate shock uh, could happen uh, is, a, is a real one that we're, we're working hard to avoid. Um, also, while we're doing the assessment and the modeling, we're not just planning for our current conditions, we're also planning climate change into our uh, evaluations. We just completed uh, a hydraulic model and uh, forecasts of climate change to predict areas within Somerville that are prone to flooding under climate change uh, conditions. Uh, this, um, is, this is a sample map for Ward 6. We're going to be rolling this out uh, over, over the coming months uh, on the engineering website uh, so that you can, and it will be part of the GIS viewer when we roll that out so you can really see uh, where those areas are. And in the meantime, obviously it's going to take us some time to design and construct the solutions to remediate the flooding. So part of this public information campaign is also about flood risk communication. In the meantime, what can you do to protect yourself and protect your property uh, against flooding, particularly if you're in one of those low-lying uh, areas? Uh, we're rolling it out in the, the four uh, major languages, English, Spanish, Portuguese, and Haitian Creole. Um, so these are examples of the infographics uh, that uh, we'll be putting out in the public and we'll be able to view. So with that, I can take a couple of questions before handing it off to Mayor. Yes? What is the association between uh, increased density in an area and the need for uh, increased pipe capacity? And, and I'm not just building closer together, but building up? It's a good question. So actually building up helps in a number of ways. We already have uh, density and we already have a lot of impervious surface. So the impervious areas do increase runoff, but it's also important to note that the native soils in Somerville aren't all that great anyway. So even if we were to leave the houses and rip up all of the asphalt, we would still have flooding problems because there's a very limited capacity of the native soils to absorb the, the water. And, and actually, because I'm a complete geek, I've studied the, um, the city's annual reports dating back to 1840. Um, and there are a lot of reports before we were paved over about persistent flooding and, and muddy uh, conditions. Um, so then that says, uh, if, if we want additional population density, going vertical um, doesn't impact the flooding at all because we put more people per square foot vertically. Uh, it's better than sprawling out horizontally. What um, about pipe size, though? So the, the pipe sizes do need to uh, increase. The, the sanitary flow is minuscule compared to the, um, to the storm flow. So the, the pipe sizes, if you go vertical with a, with a high rise, I'm maybe going to go from an 8 inch pipe to a 10 inch pipe. It's really not that big a deal. Um, the, the bigger pipes that are like 48 inches and 6 feet in diameter, that's to handle the, the stormwater flow that is agnostic to how many people per square foot you have. And the, the cost of changing from 8 to 10 inches? It it, it, 8 to 10 inch, it, it, most of the uh, cost is in the excavation and in the surface restoration, so 8 to 10 is negligible. When you're talking like a 6 foot, 8 foot diameter, that becomes um, a little bit more interesting. 
which is also why the, the solutions that we need can't all be pipe solutions. Um, and one of the other things that we're looking at are um, how to enhance our, our public spaces to better manage stormwater. Um, particularly in Europe, uh, they've uh, rounded the corner in designing streetscapes and parks and other uh, spaces around flood tolerance. And it makes a big difference if you're able to store three inches of water across an acre versus putting it in a six foot diameter pipe. Um, so as we're looking uh, at, the, at the solutions, we're looking at the full range of solutions, including how we can repurpose public space within the right of way or, or within parks or wherever uh, to store stormwater during these uh, particular cloudburst uh, events. Yes. Uh, your office also so the day, I'm glad you, we didn't put in a, a slide, and I kind of wish we had put in the slide about the Davis Square internal improvements. So yes, uh, my office does also do all the roadways and sidewalk uh, improvements, and we had the intent of. Oh, so let me back up. Again, we're doing the planning around the big pipe work that we need to do, and we know we need to do big pipe work in Davis Square. We also know that we're at a minimum four to five years away from being able to do that. And we've also acknowledged that the uh, sidewalk and crosswalk conditions in Davis Square have degraded to the point where five to ten years is not an adequate time to say, oh, we'll live with it. Um, we put together a bid package to uh, do some spot repairs in the bricks and uh, the crosswalks. Um, unfortunately, the bids came back double what we had anticipated, double what the engineer's estimate was for it. So we didn't have the funding to proceed with it. Right now what we're doing is figuring out what we can do to pare down that, um, that project to, to get a contractor in here within our budget to do essentially the worst of the worst bricks. Um, we're also looking to accelerate the planning, particularly around Davis Square, so we know which streets, for example, I, I can already tell you that Grove Street is going to have to be dug up. We're going to have to do something in Grove Street. So I don't want to do any, any improvements on Grove Street right now because it's going to be dug up in about five years. I want to be able to eliminate maybe uh, uh, Elm or Highland on this block to say, all right, we're not going to be doing big infrastructure there, we can go in and do a full-scale project in, on those blocks. So that's what we're doing over the winter. We hope to have a, a sort of interim uh, project out in the spring, uh, bid in the spring for construction in the summer. Yes? Uh, I understand the city is studying the feasibility of a stormwater enterprise fund, which might be a different way to, to finance some of the capital improvements that you're making. I'm wondering if you could comment on the progress of that study. Yeah, so, so um, we're in an interesting position um, because we're a combined sewer community, meaning that uh, sanitary and storm go into the same pipes. We already have a sewer enterprise that funds any um, construction or operations around that combined sewer system. The concept and, and, and how you know, the money comes into that fund is obviously through sewer bills. Sewer bills are calculated based on water use. Um, a you know, two or three family house uh, generates, uh, or I, I think that the math works out that it's about five two family houses use the same amount of water as Target in Union Square. Obviously, Target is a great big paved area that contributes way more stormwater than those five two family houses. So it's a, it's a question of equitability. Um, because most of the construction costs, as I said earlier, the sanitary component is very small compared to what we need to build for the stormwater. So in terms of, of equitably funding these big stormwater projects in, in the future, we want to subdivide the sewer enterprise into a sanitary component based on water use and a stormwater component based on what runs off of your property into the city system. Um, so we're, we're going through our diligence right now on what the mechanics of that, public outreach to make sure everyone understands what it is we're trying to do, and make sure that what we implement is, is fair uh, and uh, goes to what our ultimate goals are. Um, so we, we want to be very careful about how we roll this out because there's um, often backlash against these things, and it's a rain tax. 
Um, but because we're a combined sewer system, it's, very, uh, it's a very much different situation. Uh, so we're, we're looking into that. Uh, in the back. It's a good question. Uh, it, for anyone who didn't hear the question, what, what is the city doing about gas leaks? So, um, the gas companies, which in Somerville is mostly Eversource and for part of East Somerville, also National Grid, um, they are regulated at the state level by the Department of Public Utilities. So, we don't have a direct um, line to make the, those utilities do anything. However, we do have a rather good relationship with Eversource Gas. I can't say the same with Eversource Electric. Um, and uh, National Grid is, is growing. Um, we are now collecting their data on gas leaks, uh, and we're actually hoping to correlate their gas leak data versus our water system data, because the, 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 the age of the pipes that are leaking gas are similar to the age and materials of our water pipes. Um, so we're looking to see if, if perhaps there are ways that we can target areas that are gas leak prone to partner with the, the um, gas utilities to dig up those streets and do both the water and the gas at the same time. Um, Eversource uh, shares with us their, um, both their gas leak data and also their plans to replace uh, uh, their gas mains in the coming year. So we coordinate on that level uh, you know, which, which streets are prioritized. And often it's, it's around what other utilities or streets we need to go on to pave. I, can I just add to that? On a grander scale, as your point it gets lost, if Massachusetts cities and towns continue to expand gas utilization beyond current levels, we can never achieve carbon neutrality by 2040, 2050. It will never happen. So what we're trying to inform ourselves is locally, what regulatory policy changes can we adopt and or lead? You know, many of us are uh, aligning together to fight against the Weymouth compressor and other things. So, uh, I chair the Metropolitan Mayor's Coalition, which are 15 cities within the inner core of Boston. All the CEOs and mayors, we, we as an inner core region, set forth a, a carbon neutrality goal by 2050. But understanding that taking on the policies of the state to continue gas utilization or expand it is a major, major challenge we must take on if we're ever going to achieve carbon neutrality. So. Locally, we're trying to stand in terms of our ordinances, codes, what we can we do, but there's a bigger alignment we need to coalesce to take it on. I hope that helps. Great, thank you. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to the mayor. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. I always enjoy following you after exciting and innovative flood information. It's almost good as following the rodent data. <laughs> Well, it's good to see you all. Thanks for that question. I do want to commend uh, the chiefs and, and their departments for their utilization of data to put in your hands and our engineering department. I know the information can be dense to some drive, but it's really critical that we're thinking with a long-term lens uh, and that we, many communities still don't, and we struggle for years understanding how our decisions today are going to impact us 15, 20, 30 years from now, how they align with other community and policy goals, so it's critical. And we think we're learning the lessons as a society of kicking the can down the road and not being proactive in terms of our infrastructure planning investment and the consequences in our quality of life on our environment and many other things. Um, I'm tonight gonna take us back to the surface, so to speak, talk a little, uh, a little bit more about uh, our uh, some characteristics of our local economy, particularly our small business economy, um, and uh, uh, and obviously the importance of that to our local economy and uh, whether for job creation or quiet life, but we really discuss what the city is doing and try to give you some information data around 
uh, to ensure that the economy is thriving. So tonight I want to speak to you about really the many ways the, uh, behind the scenes that we are working across departments, because uh, it's even still, it might not seem but a complex issue to help our, what we call our alternative economies and small businesses adapt and thrive really a, amid a range of challenges. So uh, we're pretty fortunate and uh, we're proud uh, to have such an interesting and diverse local economy. Uh, we don't have uh, your just the your sort of paper cuts or the uh, you know typical businesses and chains, but rather what we're proud of is the bulk of that the bulk of our economy is made up of uh, locally owned, independent, and small and, and micro businesses, as well as our maker, artist, fabricated community and our self-employed residents and entrepreneurs. Who, anybody here fall in that category? Raise your hand. Yeah, this, I see you around and I know you do things I've talked to you before. And really our startups and incubators along with the, along with the new and larger employers and uh, national businesses coming to our transformational areas, which we are still in, in indeed welcoming. Uh, but the success of our, of our, our local economy uh, isn't uh, just important to individual businesses and participants, I think we could agree, but also to our community overall, our, our sort of economic diversity doesn't just fuel uh, our city and our economy, it really defines us, it's part of our DNA, our characteristics. Um, Somerville is, again, known for its local independent businesses, it's known for our creativity, our originality, fueled by our artists, our makers, uh, and more, and at the same time, their existence and productivity uh, supports the other community goals and values that, again, make us who we are. And even during the deepest abyss of the Great Recession, I'll, I'll, I'll point to this, they carried us forward long before some of the major companies who started to invest here as part of our overall growth scheme. Uh, but through them, we've achieved a, a lot of goals like uh, walkability and sustainability, diversity, and, and, the, and, and, the, and the community. And we grow uh, the jobs we're striving to create. So. The bulk of the local community, just to paint a, uh, I think the local business community, just to paint a picture, is made up uh, really for the first four groups, from the first four groups on the slide. There are small, there are creative, there are independent businesses, and uh, entrepreneurs and self-starters. So I'm going to uh, attempt to speak uh, specifically about what we're doing and how the data supports what we're trying to do to ensure that they not only stay strong, but they continue to thrive and grow is an important uh, characteristic of our overall um, uh, business community and economic base. So, good question is, um, how does it impact any one of us? How does it impact you or I? And uh, let's try to give you a few examples. As a key part of a local ecosystem, our local economy, aids us in reaching, for example, our sustainability goals. And we're talking about sustainability just now. A third of um, important statistic, a third, one third of some of those greenhouse gas emissions comes from uh, transportation, uh, with nearly 60% of that coming from passenger vehicles. It's something to keep in mind as we witness all the cut through traffic, and 85% of the vehicles that come through some of day is cut through traffic. They're not stopping at Davis or Union, even if some they're coming through some of them, continuously using it as an on and off ramp for somewhere else. Um, they come from that traffic, uh, uh, single passenger vehicle, mostly single passenger. So if we wanted to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from uh, transportation, we need to shift trips away from cars. And one way uh, to help do that is to have uh, nearby shops and amenities that make it easier to not to drive, to make you want to stay in Somerville or target Somerville as a, a destination. Uh, it's easy not to drive if we have uh, small businesses and squares, we have in neighborhoods across the city, and we can also reduce the city's um, carbon footprint if we support work models, think about this, if we support work models that require less commuting, such as entrepreneurs uh, who work out of their homes and local co-working spaces. Going back to the, deep the, 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 the Great Recession, uh, at that point in time, there was a national presidential election, and in every, historically, up until this presidential election, as we've been talking about other things, but it was always that the unemployment rate, if you hit 8%, for an incumbent president, there was always sort of the kiss of death politically, um, and there was a big talk whether Obama's administration would stay below 8%. At that time, in the deep, during the, deeper, uh, the deepest part of the recession, some of his unemployment rate was only 3.7%. Problem was 85% of the people were leaving 
the city every day going somewhere else. You know, and we put a really laser focus of creating that local climate uh, for that activity uh, to happen and occur and thrive right here in Summerville. The other part of uh, the, the ecosystem is on the affordability side. Affordability is obviously a, a critical core topic for our community. Um, one driver of affordability is uh, certainly residential taxes and whether you own or rent uh, and have the cost of taxes passed on to you, this applies to all of us. So if you want to keep residential taxes low, uh, we, as you've heard me say in previous and many other residents that meetings, we need to shift the paradigm on the tax base ratio, put more of it on the commercial side and do that by expanding the commercial tax base, thereby alleviating the stress on the residential payment. And we can do that. Um, again, by increasing commercial taxes, uh, even increasing mails and, mails and uh, sales taxes helps offset the residential taxes. It's important that our tax base ratio and that base is diversified for as many revenue streams as possible, especially in Massachusetts where municipalities have very little uh, or limited uh, revenue raising authority. Um, again, this helps small, that'll help small businesses thrive and, and welcome new ones so those revenues are increased. But, Thriving restaurants, as you can imagine, and shops, and you see everyday services, ultimately can help lower the cost of living here for everyone. And uh, not everybody, and not every community in Massachusetts, believe me, uh, <laughs> take a, uh, just a few miles away, have the luxury of, the, of that local base that we have, bringing in that diverse revenue stream. And the other part, uh, the ecosystem we focus on is really quality of life. A, a healthy and local economy also impacts again, our overall quality of life for everyone. I hear so often that um, without diversity and sense of community, uh, unwavering commitment uh, to progressive values. One thing so many of us love about living here is things like our walkability and our vibrant squares and business districts, our sidewalks that come to life. Um, they're not static at uh, 4 or 5 o'clock. You go one town over and, it, and it's like, uh, you know, it's like downtown Dallas in the old days at 5 o'clock. Uh, and we strive to make sure that our streets are robust with all types of activity. So if we, um, uh, it's going to help small businesses thrive and welcome new ones so those funds that we receive from that type of activity continues and improves our quality of life. If we want residents to be happy living in Sullivan, then we need to have, again, vibrant, robust, positive activity in our neighborhood squares and business districts. In some way we work to uh, achieve that is through uh, mobility improvements, and we have a laser focus on that now, as well as the other infrastructure that Rich talked about. That not might be the glitzy stuff, but in helping improve our overall infrastructure mobility in our squares helps us to improve the vibrancy and, and our quality of life. So uh, we also do that by um, thinking about density in a smart way and bringing cultural events that we're no stranger to here in Davis, but in all our squares across the city that bring people uh, and in turn, by bringing new customers or people who are exposed to our businesses in that square, may come back for repeat business. Uh, again, they help, again, will help provide us the services, the amenities, and really a sense of community, all within walking distance from so many of our homes. That makes some of them really unique. It makes us uh, really special. It's part of our originality that, uh, and our diversity that people rave about. But there are pressures. Uh, uh, that mean we have to be uh, remain vigilant. Um, for better or worse, we are experiencing these pressures. We're experiencing a lot of changes, both locally and globally. Uh, someone mentioned population, and keep in mind that right now, 54% of the population in the world lives in city regions like the Boston metro area. By 2050, 75% of the world's population will live in those city regions. And here in the United States, we have continued, we've been experiencing over the last several years the greatest demographic shift towards cities in the nation since the 50s. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons behind it, but that's reality. And we need to think long term about how to plan a city and what are the challenges we have to take on. So globally, um, you, know, you know, change is inevitable, uh, inevitable and it's happening uh, constantly. Some, again, are out of our control. And then we, and we have to decide how to make the best of it. Others, we need to be ready to attempt to adapt and make bold systemic policy changes to take that change on. Globally, we're facing climate change that's impacting us here right now. And some of those you heard, a growing population, the culture of convenience, 
including the shift to an online economy, how people shop, how, how they think about retail, young and old has been flipped and turned on its head, and that is competing with really your traditional uh, brick and mortar businesses. So locally in, um, in Somerville, uh, we, um, we have had to think about this, and we have changes coming in new development that we have to manage, you get all the infrastructure work, uh, construction impacts to, to mitigate, and we're part of this, again, that, in, the, that we're not immune to that population shift we're seeing globally and here across the city where people are moving to the urban core. And, uh, and that's putting a lot of pressures on us in terms of policy, but also real estate and our quality of life. So our businesses, uh, like our community, are facing both um, change and challenges. And there's, and there's no quick fix. Um, and we have to think about how, how do we help these businesses survive now, and how do we make sure that um, they are equipped to be resilient and also prepared to be, participate in the new economy that's ever evolving and succeed. So uh, again, our local businesses are still facing uh, many pressures, um, uh, competition for big box stores and change, uh, staffing challenges and barriers for, to uh, obtain startup, uh, uh, startup capital. They need information and training. Uh, they, have, they have to navigate at times red tape and bureaucracy of local or state or re regional government or different agencies. Some face, um, quite frankly, equity issues um, that create barriers uh, for, to entry for minority and other business owners uh, here in the community. And as I mentioned, construction and real estate, including rents, can present uh, another challenge to them. So what we're doing is we're working daily to uh, focus on getting members of our local economy uh, through immediate challenges, through these immediate challenges, and building resiliency and also instituting adaptability to meet the change of market so that they can prepare for a stronger future. Uh, and the challenge is that really in some of all, we have a diverse business base and core, and every business is different and faces uh, different challenges. It's not uniform. But the old model of economic development, as I stated here, it, it, it wasn't addressing the current challenges that we're facing today and the, and the needs of the future. Uh, the really small and the micro and alternative startup um, businesses face. So the city really started to begin thinking or you know, looking through a different lens, thinking creatively about how to address really the modern economic development needs. Um, some important data uh, and why this it gives good context, uh, that why we needed to up our game and, and this speaks to it because the odds are against those motivated people who open their own businesses and what this slide shows is that half of the small businesses nationally fail within five years and one-third uh, fail within ten. Um, it's not easy to take that risk. Uh, and I mean, you know, people, we want people to chase that dream, but we want them to succeed. Launching is one thing, and having a sustainable model for success is another. We have to understand how we can set that table or that path for success. So just as, um, uh, just as our community and economy is diverse, our solutions and really our support systems I must be adapted and updated to really fit the needs that come up, and we have to be flexible and we have to be dynamic. So, uh, again, we all uh, must be personal and innovative when it comes to supporting and really helping um, and find solutions because every business is different, and really they all can all face their own particular changes and challenges, although there are some similarities, uh, whether it's workforce development and whether it's facing business development issues, real estate development, everything in between. Uh, but I'm not going to list how we're working to counter all these challenges. What I'm trying to, going to try to give you is a window into really three uh, broad examples of what our alternative um, economic development looks like in action, starting with really a closer look at some of the ways uh, we connect uh, customers to small local businesses and also supporting our, our creative economy. So. Somerville is known and loved for, uh, uh, for many things, and one of it is the, its creativity and its originality, the strength of its uh, uh, in the arts. But when the Arts Council hosts some, something like the Fluff Festival, or a fun festival like the Big Gay Dance Party or Arpi, it's not just a great way, like I do, for many of us to spend that Saturday. It's a really immensely effective way to support our squares and local businesses. So I'm going to explain why. 
For every, as stated here, every one dollar we spend on festivals <clears throat> as a community, um, on murals and our cultural events, uh, what we see is $4.40, more than $4 in economic impacts. Uh, first, there are the direct benefits, obviously, to the artist, uh, to those makers. We hire and provide vending opportunities to as well as the money uh, the Arts Council pays for supplies like tents or uh, promotional um, uh, posters and the such. Indirect and compounding impacts come as some of those dollars then get spent again locally in our squares. And finally, when we draw crowds in, uh, those crowds will visit the local shops, they'll buy food, They'll buy art, uh, they'll supply the, the revenue stream to those establishments. While the festivals visitors, visitors actually notice restaurants they, uh, and services and even nonprofits to also turn to and that they also turn to later. So this is the kind of placemaking uh, that builds uh, that customer base over time and the data re really supports this. So <coughs> investing in the arts maybe to some an unconventional economic development tool, but we've already seen, going back a while now, uh, how much return an, an, that investment can produce. Uh, we've been making these types of smart investments um, now for a while. We've, um, by recognizing the strengths in the arts and targeting the arts, the multiplier effect I mentioned is, is really significant. Uh, when an independent research firm looked just at the economic impact of our arts union project we launched over a decade ago in Union Square, that program in Union Square. Um, the arts series was founded, uh, found to be injecting between roughly $200,000 to $300,000 into Union Square annually for very little upfront cost. So the return on investment was far exceeding any, anyone's expectation. Um, I look back at event spending by the Arts Council over five fiscal years. Uh, multiplied conservatively by four, not the 4.4 on the screen I previously showed you. Uh, the researchers identify, uh, identified, what, the, the, what they identify shows our cultural and really arts events have injected more than $3 million. More than $3 million over five years right into our local economy, right into our business districts and squares and our small businesses. And that doesn't even include um, spending covered by grants or the increase to the meals or hotel tax uh, that you know they surely and we know uh, we don't need hard research to prove that uh, that they contribute to but I want to uh, really come back again and focus a little bit more on the place making piece of because people stick around in places if they feel comfortable there uh, if they feel that social cohesiveness there uh, and we strive to make them comfortable uh, with all types of activities, with outdoor furniture, appearing in parks and uh, other places and uh, uh, special events. So here's an interesting data point. Uh, when we do this, we see results at the Kenny, at Kenny Park in Davis Square. We all know where that is. After we fixed the water for, uh, feature and we added the movable pop-up chairs, uh, we saw 40% more people sitting in the park. So you might say, well, sitting in the park doesn't exactly bring money. Well, no, when we, it, 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 it certainly does if people see the square or the park as a place and the spillover effects to our businesses. But there's also the social equity and capital helps build up as people become connected and engage one another and get to know one another in the community. But we see more parents watching kids in the splash park by day, couples on dinner dates in the evening, again, that we find also in turn supports the businesses in the square. But when you drive, with the cut through traffic through some of all, uh, you miss the businesses, which is why mobility investments, and we've been focused on this, supports a local economy. So studies have found that when communities improve pedestrian and cycling, I've been starting, shouting out these statistics from Brookings for a long time, the higher your bike count and bike scores and walk count, the better your local businesses. Uh, we found that when that happens, again, communities improve, their pedestrian cycling infrastructure, they gain net new businesses. They gain private investment, in which increases, and customers tend to spend more. Um, dedicated bus lanes, because it's a big talk of the town, are part of this as well. Uh, they increase ridership, uh, so you get more people walking past businesses to and from the bus stops rather than speeding by leading, uh, uh, 
by leading to more, and, and again, which leads to more customers. Again, it's a simple adage. If you plan a city for cars and cut through traffic, that's what you're going to get. If you plan a city of places and destinations and you embrace the tenets of human scale, uh, well, that, we're going we're gonna to reap the benefits of that. Uh, there are many studies that show the benefits for local businesses when more people walk or ride bikes. And this is the data from um, Portland. Uh, is just one example which showing that cyclists tended to spend more per month because they stopped more often at local businesses and followed by pedestrians and then car drivers uh, as well and persons using transit. Just as our, but just as our community and economy is, is diverse, our solutions and support systems must be and I think you can imagine be adapted and updated to fit the needs that are evolving and that come up. So we must be personal and innovative when it comes to supporting and helping uh, find solutions uh, to equity issues because every business, again, is different. And uh, every business faces different challenges uh, on a regular basis. Um, opening a business, anybody here, has anybody opened up a business on their own recently in the last five years? No one? Probably, yeah. Well, I know you must know someone has, but opening a business, you can imagine, takes a lot of work. And there are some barriers that, to entry that can really keep people locked out of that dream. Um, not having access to capital uh, or funds to, to cover overhead and startup costs. Having to figure out all the associated uh, red tape. Maybe it's language barriers. Finding the right space and being able to afford it. Having all the necessary skills and training to handle all the parts of the business. And those and many other variables come into play. Um, I'm sorry. But we see how this plays out really in our census data. Now, let me get my slides off here. Um, the majority of businesses we know right now are male, owned by male uh, here in, in Somerville. Minorities only own 18% of the business in some of them. This is in a city where one-third of the population uh, is foreign-born. It's an important data point. We need to ask why. And uh, do we care about it? As a city that strives for equity, as we hold out an important part of our characteristics and DNA, our originality, our diversity, does it mean something to us? And, uh, and how do we approach this? How do we utilize uh, that data? Uh, some of those, these barriers are long-standing, and they're, they're actually systemic, as you can imagine. A study of, uh, for example, of the wealth in Boston, which the Boston area includes us, found that white households uh, in the area had a median net worth of um, nearly a quarter of a million dollars, while African-American households had a median net worth of eight dollars. Uh, without capital, imagine now, you want to, and it really, this is a statistic that drove the city my administration, the city council, in terms of approach to equity on recreational marijuana permits and licenses, you know, who's been, who's suffered the most in the war on drugs, and is there an equitable pathway forward to participate in a new economy? But, as, you know, I mean, this is important because without capital or some financial security, God bless you, opening a business, you know, might be too big a risk. You need to ask yourself, how do I get my arms around this? I mean, I have a great idea, I have a concept, I know I can make what I don't have capital, and I can't get through all these loopholes, and this, the economy is really not going to serve me. So what kind of impact can this have? Yeah. Well, look at, again, again, we have to consider how people, people typically uh, fund a small business startup. Uh, many use credit cards or home equity, and you can see how this would be a challenge uh, for many of our minority entrepreneurs. But here's an example, Nibble. Nibble is one uh, attempt that the city of Somerville launched uh, and lowering the barriers for immigrant entrepreneurs. So immigrants uh, are twice as likely to start a business <clears throat> as U.S. born residents, but can run into, uh, again given the statistics I just mentioned, run into roadblocks and around things like language barriers, startup costs, and getting the proper permits and certifications. So the Art Council's Nibble program helped immigrant entrepreneurs navigate the red tape it helped them and offer support in other languages. It helped them organize um, low overhead events like pop-ups and uh, vending at festivals. And you probably saw these vendors there. They've been around for now a little bit. And two permanent businesses, as a result, have grown out of it. Las Carolinas uh, in uh, Nibble Kitchen at Bull Market with an ADA-compliant commercial kitchen. 
And this is a model, economic de uh, the economic development headed by Tom Galagani uses in other industries at their one-stop shop events where business owners uh, can come talk to any relevant city departments uh, to get help with permits and licenses and get help in other languages. But this is one great example and uh, really success story how we were able to help two entrepreneurial businesses launch and uh, I think they're going to be really successful. They have great products, by the way. Tasted many of them. Uh, sometimes uh, lowering the barriers to entry means looking at our own rules uh, here in the city and regulations and updating to be in sync with current businesses. So here's some examples where we've done that. Uh, liquor licenses and going back now well over 10 years, some of all was not unlike other communities. We had a certain number of liquor licenses and it is still real in Massachusetts that there is a per capita formula of how many liquor license you can have. Your city has no relevant, it really is strange, there's no, there's no relevant formula to the amount of business activity you have, but how many people are there, and we'll tell you how many people can access alcohol. That's what it is. So we have a certain amount of licenses, and under the old way in Somerville, if you folks in the front had a license, you didn't own it. You possessed the privilege of, you know, you had the privilege of possessing it, and with that came the privilege of transferring or selling that privilege at a fair market value, as if you owned it. So what's happening in Boston right now, those, those licenses you have to sell, you have to buy one in Boston about $475,000. In some of all, uh, 25 years ago, when I started in politics, that was about $40,000. They got as high as $200,000 in some of those licenses. So what we saw is this was a barrier to entry for most, if not you know, any, any entrepreneur, especially an immigrant entrepreneur. Think about it. I want to start a restaurant, have a great concept. I have to shell out how much money? And, and rather than put it into business concept and design, so oh, we've had three tries at this. We've expanded, and we work with the Chamber of Commerce, we work with local businesses, we work with the community, we brought in more licenses beyond our per capita formula through local legislation, special legislation with the City Council and then the Board of Aldermen, and we made those licenses non-transferable. So you pay a nominal fee to the city. If you meet these requirements, you go to the Licensing Commission, we, we make a recommendation, they vote on it, you get your license, and when you're done, it comes back to us. So there's no, so there's no underground economy in the licenses anymore. And in fact, we tried to advise Boston on this, so uh, again, it's a nominal fee of the city, and now we've seen, you see the best, the, the best of Boston and the restaurants, a lot of them in some of them, a lot of them are immigrant-owned. And what, you know, because they can make 20% more in revenue by having that alcohol license, and it's a cultural thing. And I have to credit, I don't know Steve Mackey's here from the Chamber. Back in 1999, we had the first shot at this. Some of them had no beer and wine licenses. And when, you, when all the new restaurants started coming in, you were paying $13 to $15 for an entree, and you had to drink a Nantucket nectar with it, because there was really limited licenses. And it was very hard to survive, uh, especially if businesses have seen a rising cost per square foot of their rent. Uh, we've also looked at other examples you know, in our food trucking industry, you know, creating flexibility to look. You know, create a lower startup cost, eliminating the need for a right uh, to real estate. And so we're, we're updating our regulations to allow them more and, and having more flexibility, predictability and clarity for them, for the neighborhood, and also allowing them uh, to thrive. But our economic development efforts need to keep up also with how people are working. Um, the way work has changed, the way people work has definitely changed, and we're looking to ways to support that. Uh, there are 5.6 million small micro businesses in the United States and almost all have fewer than 100 employees, 89% have fewer than 20 employees. So these sort of small shops still need office slash lab manufacturing space but might not want or be able to afford their own space. So what we're doing is we look at supporting co-working and incubator spaces where those companies can start, they can begin as well as helping them find uh, new spaces in Somerville as that company matures uh, to the next level. Greentown Labs is a great example of that. They're now home to a total of 120 businesses uh, which have used the space. They started with 25 five years ago, Somerville, something like that, 25, and they're now the largest clean tech climate solution incubator in North America, soon the world here in Somerville. And, uh, you know, some of the businesses have been like L3, Voxel8, and Right Hand Robotics have grown into larger spaces and continue to grow. Um, and Greentown Labs, for example, has created more than 900 jobs in Sunbowl. 
900 jobs. And we supported this type of environment by, one, luring them here to a spot in some off the seaport when it became too expensive for them. We, we created an innovation fund, which is a loan fund to them, but with the, the, and the quid pro quo was to create jobs, which they surpassed that goal for some of them, um, and provided opportunities for them to partner in some of us. So they have all these climate solution companies, and we've allowed some of them to be their test lab for different types of ideas. For example, if they had an, uh, a civ tech app or civic technology app to measure or manage the, uh, the energy systems in the building, and they needed a proof of concept in the field, we, we put out our, on, on RFI for companies to test their products in some of them, help us understand how we can meet our climate solution goals and help them succeed and grow in some of them. So, so that's taught us some really uh, good lessons uh, as well. Um, places like Artisans Asylum, like Greentown, um, really offers uh, alternative workspace for makers uh, and, and some of all. And they've been really, again, 150 small businesses have been supported, more than 100 jobs created, uh, more than almost 2,500 people have been trained in fabrication, Archie Chia, again, anything from, as I stated here, jewelry, 3D design, weld them. Um, but they've uh, uh, created about more than $30 million in local economic impact since their founding. And really, this is something that really creeped out on us. Honestly, the sound started off in Brick Bottom on Joy Street. Uh, there's people coming together, and the question we have for them back then is, what are you doing here? And what is going on? And, you know, how, do we, how do we understand this new way of working and co-working and this fabrication and make a move, and how do we, su how do we support it? But well, long before that happened, the city has played a real significant role in helping them get established. And we're still working to make sure they continue to uh, con Tribute you know, to our creative economy and our overall economy, um, and uh, we're going to continue to uh, promote our partnerships, give them as much support. We're looking at our regulatory systems like our zoning. We're protecting uh, and designating those fabrication spaces, like those little foundry, those factory uh, plants. That uh, we saw a movement that was too much towards uh, converting them to mixed use, and what we didn't want is, as a city that was so synthetic, that was mixed use up and down the streets. We wanted those spaces that had urban edge, that have a large floor plates where you can uh, allow for collaborative creativity. And really when you create that bump factor we like to refer to where magic really happens and innovation occurs and, and it's spurring new things in our economy, a trajectory that we never imagined more than a decade ago. Um, so what, uh, I go back, what Greentown is for clean tech and what Artisans is for makers is happening in other sectors as well. We have Co-working uh, space is opening. We looked at our own regulations, as I said, for home-based businesses and changed those so it's easy for people uh, to work at home. We continue to do that. Um, we are adopting artist and maker-friendly zoning. Uh, economic Development Charm Shop has expanded their programs beyond traditional brick-and-mortar programs. Example, storefront improvements. That used to be a focus years ago. Not that that's not important, but we have an active entrepreneur network where small businesses and the uh, owners and self-employed people can get together to network and share advice um, right, on their success and their best practices. And between 75 to 80 percent of uh, member businesses are women and or uh, minority owned. And that's a really exciting trend. But you've heard uh, me talk about some of the things the city is doing to support small business, but also it's worth pointing out that we individually as consumers have a lot of power here, a lot of power we can exercise as well. Uh, and you've heard this before, but when you spend locally, you are investing uh, in some of them. And this is where all our actions individually come in. When you shop locally, a greater percentage stays local and continues to help some of the businesses, hire people in the community. And a lot of times, small businesses, they're sponsoring other important community organizations, youth sports teams school activities, nonprofit uh, and social service networks here in the city. If you're deciding where to spend your money, uh, keep in mind that your dollars have a bigger impact again when you spend locally. Uh, and what this chart shows is that when you shop at a chain retailer, only an estimated 13.6% of your dollars uh, spent recirculates back into the uh, local economy. When you shop at an independent local retailer, nearly half of those dollars, as shown here, funnels back into the community as, as owners and staff uh, participate here locally. Uh, making the choice to go to local business is a way looking to invest back into some of them. Um, and you can see the recirculation numbers here for every uh, $100 
Uh, you spend uh, locally owned restaurants sixty-five dollars of that. Sixty-five will stay in some of And what happens uh, when you spend that same hundred dollars in the national chain restaurant? It's pretty clear. Almost uh, half of it doesn't stay in the city. It, it, it goes somewhere else. It subsidizes a larger part of their own uh, portfolio. Um, so again, our local businesses and entrepreneurs do face a lot of challenges, and it's complex, and we're trying to understand and su support them. Um, uh, and we're doing this on all fronts. One positive indicator, though, is that the number of small, uh, some of the businesses continue to grow each year. Some of the businesses. From 2012 to 2018, you can see by the chart, uh, the, uh, the number of businesses increased by roughly 23%. And that's a net of uh, about 489 businesses. And the, the majority of these businesses are small. Uh, most of these are smaller micro businesses. That means less than five employers, including the owner. Uh, but cumulatively, they are still the foundation of the economic engine uh, of who we are here in Somerville. Uh, we have a target of la launching that next great thing and being a home for a climate solution, for tech, and for life sciences. But it's that innovative, small, eclectic mix of small businesses that really is the bedrock of our local economy. So just to conclude, I want to be clear uh, as well that this is not a it's not a spectator sport. As our intrepid entrepreneurs and self-employed residents, artists, makers, and small business owners work to succeed and as the city works uh, to support them, again, I want to remind ourselves of the role individually we have to play. As we shop locally, we invest locally, our money stays here locally. Um, but I think if you have time, I wanted to give you this bit of information. Did I'm happy to take some questions. Tom Galligani is here from the Office of Strategic Planning and uh, uh, Community Planning Development, as well uh, as the part of the Economic Development Division. But happy to take any questions you have now. Uh, Ron? I'll go right around. I'm a little bit concerned that with the joint proposal for Ward 6, it's going to force the city to pay for We have a whole row of small businesses that start with the kittens and ends and drag pizza. And if we have a zoning that gives an incentive to build a six story building there, those are all going to go away and they're unlikely to come back. So, how do we prevent that from happening? So, let me repeat the question. Uh, Ron, I'm just going to paraphrase, so I'll summarize some of the stuff. The concern about if we allow for heights, um, and particularly you talk to the the case of um, where right, so Dana is um, selling a proposed sale to escape the uh, heights of small businesses like those and like the McKinnons and the Burns and so forth could be displaced and so forth. That is our concern as well. So what we're trying to understand is two things. One, we know we have to create daytime upper story tendency in order to support our businesses here. That is one thing painfully missing in Davis Square. And I said this before a few years ago as a cautionary note. If we don't find a way to increase daytime upper story tendency in Davis Square, it will become what Harvard Square is now. I'm not sure if I could run the right way. Well, I'm not speaking that project, but that project yeah. there, all that has occurred is that there's been a purchase and sale of land. Yeah. There's been nothing proposed to the city. Whether it was that project, a hotel, a tech company, you want to do something funky above and wrong, we tell you the same thing. We want those doors, that characteristic of streetscape to stay. That has to happen. So there'll be a lot of community meetings in that. But in general, I know the planning staff is working together the community in the Davis Square plan. We appreciate that work. I know it's something we care about because there are a lot of great establishments here in life. They will not survive only on when they can't be open from lunch Monday through Thursday. When the oh, majority of their revenues come in on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday evenings, it just won't work because the cost per square foot of their rent is going up as well, and we don't have enough daytime economic activity in the square. We have to do that in balancing the concerns of the residents. We agree, and that's what we're trying to work on together. Uh, we want our quality of life to be enhanced by that, but I know what we all don't want is for it to become another mall uh, right here on the west side of the city. Uh, in the back, yep. I'll, I'll go right around. Yes, sir. Oh, I had a suggestion, a question, and a comment. I have a suggestion, a question, and a comment. Thank you. Um, it would be nice if you allowed an experiment food trucks between Willow and Cedar on the community path. Um, on, uh, the on the path. path. On the path. On the path. Anybody hear that? Okay. It would be nice if we could experiment with food trucks between Willow and Cedar. I'm just repeating this comment. The community path. That was an experiment. I think it might be interesting. Okay. Uh, Johnny Dees, do 
know what's going to happen. Is there going to be music there or not? And the last comment I have is relatively show how it's important to get people on their feet or on bikes and how that's helpful to the community. But you haven't funded it commensurate with the importance. We heard tonight that you put out proposals for some funding to fix things that have been identified. The price came in over what was expected, and it was decided not to fund all of the repairs. The, the, the Davis Square needs infrastructure improvement now. We agree with that. We are going to the interim, the interim funding request, which we will follow up on, there will be those improvements. Those are to maintain some stability in the square. But I would submit, and I think you would agree, the type of mobility transformation that happens it has, to be, has to be much bolder in, Dave, in, in Davis and, and across the city. We have, we have to make a collective decision here. Are you satisfied with cutting traffic in the middle of Davis? Or do you want to have more people activity and enhanced economic activity? We are all in on that. There won't be a problem funding it from the city side. Um, you know, did we have a little time to figure this out because I don't think you want us shutting down Davis Square today. Uh, we would literally be choked up from the rest of the world. Uh, but over the next several months and over the next year, everything will start opening up on the other part of the city. Uh, we have to be charged and do this together. We should be thinking boldly to meet our economic goals, our mobility goals, our climate change goals. I agree with you 110%. There was another point. Johnny Keys. I didn't see. Uh, for the, you asked him for the uh, the, the commercial uh, ground floor. Do we have a, any any time on Johnny Keys yet? We don't know who the tenant is on the first floor. We don't know. Not yet. We'll be back to you. Uh, yes, I'm going to go back. We'll go here and go right back. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, this is just about walkability. And um, walking around the telephone poles now, we've gone from the ugly mess up above with all the cables to uh, double poles, and now we've got an ugly mess where um, mostly a lot of the time it's um, uh, the developers come in, they take all the wires off the, off the houses, and they're just wrapped around the poles now. They're just hanging there. It's, it's really ugly. When you're walking around, and it's not pleasant. Did you hear that? I'm going to just repeat. Concerns about the utility poles, yeah. uh, where you have that spaghetti stick on top, and it looks like cotton candy on top with all the wires, and we've gone from that to double poles, which uh, we, we took a big bite out of that over the years. That was a big one for a while. It's still creeping up. I've noticed it in a few spots now more down um, in terms of wires being wrapped around the development side. So, um, it, you know, I'd like to hear more about it. I haven't heard much on the data on side, but if you're hearing, you're seeing that, we'd like to do more rich... Uh, actually, yeah, I would say that'd be more of an ISD, right? On the highway division? Yeah, we could follow up on that. I'd like to know how prevalent that is. But I know the council's all over this because when I was in legislative life, that was a yeah, it, the double poles was the big issue. It's mad. And the council is keeping, you know, usually on a pole, it's not one utility, there's probably nine entities it's, it's, on a pole. It's more like figuratively a circle of utilities all standing there pointing to the people next to them. Yeah. yeah. If I had I wish, I mean, you really should bury all those poles permanently on the ground. Uh, I, if you're realistic, that's not going to happen in any of our lifetimes, but that's what should happen. But when you see new districts being developed, you've seen those utilities better on the ground, but we have these battles all the time on who owns what wire, allowing two poles to be doubled up and piggybacked on one another, or allowing for that mess that you see there, or why is it hanging close to the ground. So there are particular issues. Please give it to us. We'll follow up on it. And Who do you give it to? Already, uh, Rich and Brad will take it. But also, uh, I want to hear, because the, the council will be interested in hearing this, because they've helped. They've been holding um, license or a certain request from the utilities in abeyance until they address some of these issues. So it's a good time to tell us that. Um, yeah, how you doing? I have a question. Uh, we're fortunate to have a very old house in Davis Square, 150 years old. The trees were planted when the house was built. We've lost two of them now because they were threatening the house. We think a lot about trees. Can you tell me what ideas the city has about trees? Because they're an important part to make it a pleasant place and also like a lot of uh, When I say the city, I'll talk about all of us, you, what we've heard, the council, administration, we have a goal to increase our overall canopy extensively, but we also put a focus, you know, how trees are being cut down on private property, not just the ones we're trying to protect from issues like the Emerald Ash Borer on our public ways, or that uh, gas leaks are destroying or damaging, or when we have other major infrastructure projects, or perhaps we're planted properly, so we have an aggressive program to continue to increase our tree canopy. 
but we've part of that canopy is also what's on private property. We've seen some um, recalcitrant developers will come in and they'll clear these beautiful uh, shade trees off private property uh, to do their project. The council uh, passed and signed an ordinance which went into effect August, September 1st. And um, so um, on the public side, um, you know, it was a tough year for the tree a year ago in Somerville, given what had to be cleaned in the Green Line Corridor. We're focused on reforestation of that corridor, given what happened, uh, what had to be done around the high school projects so on our public properties. We look to create uh, more transparent uh, processes around tree removal, a very aggressive um, program with our Urban Forestry Division. Brad, chime in here too, if you're not in previously. Yeah, I was going to mention that about us. There, was, there are still seats on the Urban Forestry Committee, and we'd love to have people participate. Um, we could, you know, see us afterwards to tell you how to get your name in that because the community is really driving this conversation, which is fantastic. Don't forget to follow up with Jeffrey or anybody else. And trees at summerbelladay.gov is their multiple staff address where you get the response from our team. We're also cracking down in terms of the maintenance of what we have. We, we actually know all the tree uh, species in the city. And so we've been very careful about the type of species we plant, not to be predominantly heavy on one species versus another because if an illness or disease comes through, it wipes out a significant portion of our tree canopy. But also how the utility, going back to utility companies, they come to their tree trimming. I mean, they, it's bad. I mean, you look at a tree, it, it looks like the, the field goal post at a football stadium. They cut the whole middle of it. We are all, we are having a fun part of one, which has raised the ear of the council and others. You know, how, you know, going back to utility comes. So it's one, how do we grow the canopy? Two, what is the proper maintenance and care to the canopy that we have? But not just in our public ways, on our private property. What is the responsibility of all of us, even as property owners? And I think we need to play heavy on that and make sure that, you know, we just don't have freelance clearing of, of all our trees, whether it's public or private property. Um, someone else? Cool. In the back? Yes. Hi. I just want to say thank you. The other thing I want to mention local businesses, I, I, I should have did at the beginning to apologize to them and to you for your the inconvenience of pace with infrastructure. They've been great. There's some of the bridge closures. Uh, they're going to be, it's going to be fantastic when the green line opens for them, but it's a hit to them between now and then. As it is an inconvenience for us with all the traffic disruption, we know from all the data that they're taking a little hit. We're working closely to promote them, let them know, hey, ball squares still, ball squares still happening and so forth. But if you get a chance, Go at least once a month to, to one of those restaurants or cafe or shops. Do it. That's what we do. Um, but they could use our support. They use our support. Yes. Hi. Um, you, you spoke about the need to develop daytime traffic so businesses could, small businesses could survive in the square. Daytime um, upper story tenancy. Yeah. Right. Um, but if the height of the buildings there are in some cases they'll be tripled. Um, developers are going to be coming in wanting to build up and businesses that are unique and what increase our happiness quotient um, can't survive the construction period. And even if they could, they could not afford to come back because the rents would be even higher with huge developers coming in who want to return on investment. So I really don't see, and, there, and there's some, 
Byrne, McKinnon, Sligo have all survived without an increase in daytime upper story traffic. So I appreciate that. I would say they're there for now. And, and all the data points to it. It's not going to be, and some may persevere no matter what. Some, many will not. It will change. That's been the trend that's happened in Harvard Square. I would say, but you bring up a good point. Because some people, there's, there's two concerns. No matter what the upper story tenant is, you're right. There's, what's it do to the cost per square foot of any tenant than the ground floor? But even if you can meet that concern, where's the, uh, there's a business disruption gap. It's, it's hard to say, well, I'm going to shut my business for a year, 18 months, I'll come back in and everything's the same. So these things, have to, you have to thread that needle carefully. You bring up a really good point. And no matter what happens on that block or any block, these are the conversations we're leading as an administration, but as a community, we need to engage in. I appreciate that comment. It's absolutely correct. And there are some techniques and things we can do around that. Um, because even if I, you're on the ground floor of the building that I'm building, and I'm going to pay you what you would have made in that year disruption, it's not easy to flip the switch and ramp back up again. Uh, you're right. Uh, we're, we're seeing that just on infrastructure disruption. So uh, these are the conversations, no matter who the tenants are. But I will say, and you can look at all the data, all the information, if we don't have the daytime upper story tendency and activity in any square, um, any of our squares, it, it, it poses a great challenge for survival and sustainability for any local businesses. Some, because of the nature of what of their business, might persevere. May happen the more others will not, uh, or others will come in, and they could be subsidized by some national chain, and they can absorb that that lesser revenue versus anyone else. So, but they're all good points, and we need to be part of that conversation. I can take a. Couple more. I'm going to end with you, Lee, because you're always a good one to end one. Yes. <laughs> yeah, in the back, sir. Sure. Uh, can you give us an update on the change made to the condo conversion ordinance? Uh, the condo conversion ordinance. Can we? Uh... Like, you know, yeah, I will. I'm happy to talk about you after this. I just want to finish on this slide. And if anyone wants to talk about condo conversion, uh, we can talk a little bit about it here uh, afterwards. But I'm going to just finish up on this one here. I'll be around.